This Fluster Clucks episode is sponsored in part by EarthBreeze Laundry Detergent. Okay, let me tell you, this is a great idea. It is so simple, and I'll tell you, this stuff works. These Echo Sheets from EarthBreeze are vegan, cruelty-free, and dermatologically tested and safe for sensitive skin. And they have a buy one, give 10 initiative with each purchase donating 10 loads of laundry to a charitable cause of your choice. So a whopping 30 million loads have already been donated and these little sheets have just turned a chore into an act of kindness. And most importantly, you still get a powerful clean for your clothes because that's what we're looking for, right? I have stinky clothes. I go to the gym. My husband, maybe a little TMI here, he has stinky clothes too. I am picky about how detergent works. This detergent works. I love it. I am a satisfied customer. I'll stinky tell you. families unite. Stinky <laughs> families unite. That's right. So all of you stinky families out there, you got to get these Earth Breeze sheets. So now's the time to try Earth Breeze because right now you can subscribe and save 40% off. If you go to earthbreeze.com slash flusterclucks. That's earthbreeze.com slash flusterclucks for 40% off. You can talk about training if you get a puppy, like how do you train a puppy or how do we get ready for the school day or how do we cook a meal? And it goes back too to this flexibility in problem solving. There are certain things in which there has to be a distinct order. And then there are other certain things we can problem solve like Michael Keaton did, where he brought his own creativity or his own flexibility to it. But you've got to let your kids go through the process and look for opportunities for them to find their way to do it. Welcome to Fluster Clucks with Lynn Lyons, where we talk about how to manage those tricky emotions that show up in all families. Serious stuff without being too serious. I'm your co-host, Robin, and I'm Lynn's sister-in-law, and I'm here to ask your questions. And I'm Lynn Lyons. I'm an anxiety expert, speaker, mom, and author, and I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Parenting can be a Fluster Clucks, and I'm here to help you find your way. And I'll even tell you what to do and what to say. Robin, people ask me all the time, what are the skills? Because I talk about skills all the time. They want a list of the skills. I can give you a list of the skills, but here's one of the major skills. The ability to problem solve. And remember that when we look at the research about kids that are raised in highly anxious environments, they have limited independent problem solving. So we really want to look at developing your child's ability to problem solve. Well, Lynn, this sounds like we should replay our really popular episode, How to Raise Problem Solvers. Yes, I think this is an episode that is worth repeating and worth listening to again and again. So Lynn, today we hit the third topic of this three episode series on really your core principles. And today is problem solving. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like I was thinking about this. I was like, well, flexibility and autonomy and problem solving. I mean, they're so connected to each other and really developing flexibility and supporting autonomy. The result is that we want kids to grow into young adults and old adults, I guess, that are good problem solvers, among other things. But that's just such a core thing. So what are the things I imagine when you think of problem solving and you think of a child or a teenager who has low problem solving skills? Mm -hmm. You can correct me, but I'm imagining that if that child comes from a household where they aren't given the space to flex the muscles of figuring out what to do. Mm -hmm. It's that child or teenager who, when you say, well, what would you do if blah, blah, blah? And they say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I expect someone else to step in and do it for me. I have a perception that I'm helpless. It's a little kid who, if they don't get practice, you've got a teenager who doesn't feel like they can solve that problem. So yeah, that's exactly right. It's sort of if we were talking about working that autonomy muscle, it's the same thing. This is the downside of not allowing kids to problem solve is that you're exactly right, is that then their perception of themselves is that they're incompetent or they're incapable, that they can't figure things out. When adults step in quickly and they don't give kids the opportunity to try things out or figure things out, 
and get themselves out of difficult situations. See, that's the the little bit of a difference between autonomy and problem solving is there is a problem to solve. So maybe they've already gotten themselves into a little bit of a tough jam or there's something that they need to do. There's something that they need to accomplish. There's a place that they need to get. So if you've got a kid who's got a strong sense of autonomy, so they're capable of stepping out into the world and they have that sense of mastery, that's great. And now we just want to really make sure that they know how to go from point A to point B. That's problem solving. Well, the other thing is in the last week's episode, and we talk about flexibility, when you have rigidity and when you need something to go a certain way, and obviously life throws us lemons all the time. Mm hmm. That problem solving is also that skill to adapt, yeah. that resilience, that ability to like pick a new direction. Mm -hmm. So I threw my mom a bit under the bus in the first episode of the series on autonomy. Yeah. She cared that I always looked a certain way and she was one of those perfectionist moms. Mm -hmm. But I want to share a personal story and I could be personal because... She's she's gone. <laughs> so, <laughs> the mothers that we can talk about on podcasts are yeah, the ones yeah. that have passed. Yeah. So when she was in her late 20s, she saw a counselor for the first time. And based on her upbringing, the counselor or the therapist at the time was like, how would you solve these problems? And my mom was in her late 20s, already a mother. Mm -hmm. And she said, I don't know. And this therapist was very good. She talked about these few sessions the rest of her life. Yeah. So in those moments, she said, I realized that my own mother and my father sort of always came in and saved the day, solved my problems to the point where I hadn't flexed that muscle. Mm. And when I realized that, I never wanted my children to experience that ever. Mm. So this is actually the one area in parenting. She kind of did some amazing things. And I think it's an interesting meta point that we're not perfect parents and there's a big scorecard. Right. And we're going to be really good at helping our kids develop certain skills and others are going to be challenging for us. But so what my mother did was she always said, I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. How would you do that? I mean, mm. to the point where by the time I was 15, I was like, my mom doesn't know anything because she she <laughs> pretended to be helpless in a sense. Like, so I had to always come up with something. I never had a habit of counting on her to give me an answer. And it worked. Mm -hmm. And we laughed later that she actually said to me, which is so different now in this culture, you're 12 years old. You can schedule your own doctor's appointment if you're sick. Mm -hmm. She really said that to me. And so at 12 years old, I was scheduling my doctor's appointments if I was sick. Mm -hmm. And I credit her with because she never stepped in to solve that muscle is very like I have a very strong problem solving muscle. You do. And she yeah, you can attest to that. Like I'm good at that. And yeah, but here's the thing. I have to be so careful that I'm not solving my kids problems because it's like a generational cycle, right? Like, oh, it, yeah. I want to show my love. I have to remember, I have to make a conscious choice to show my love by not stepping in because yeah. I'm pretty capable of solving problems. Your love language, so to speak, right, is like, I can help you. Yes. I can help you figure this out. I know that's so true. And that's so interesting in terms of that generational skip. And I was just talking to my mom about this, who's not dead. So hi, mom. Yeah. So that's so interesting how it skips that generation, right? And your love language, so to speak, if we were to use that terminology, is problem solving. Right. You do an amazing job. I mean, that's your profession as a travel advisor. People are always calling you or texting you or talking to you about how to solve this problem. Right. And you make it happen. So it's hard when that's our strength not to do it. Definitely. I struggle with that, actually. Yeah. So one of the things that I have done knowing it is my one of my weaknesses as a parent is that I have made a habit of modeling and talking about how I'm problem solving mm -hmm. in my own situations mm -hmm. so that I might forget and step in and do something. But I also talk about how I solve something. So that's a really important distinction you're making because modeling problem solving 
is so much different than stepping in and doing it for them. So you're really good at problem solving. So you're showing them how to problem solve for themselves rather than stepping in and problem solving for them. That is such an important distinction to make. You know where this is a great exercise is like helping your kids build something. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Baking is like tough because you're like, oh, we spent two hours on this <laughs> thing. And then like <laughs> something happens that you could have fixed. And yeah. then it's like, what, what? Like the cake is terrible or the yeah. cookies aren't good. But when you build something, mm -hmm. that's a great way to then say like, OK, you've hit a wall because the instructions aren't great on this thing you're trying to assemble, mm -hmm. whether it's Legos or whatever. And that I always say, like, when I hit a wall and I can't go over it, I try and go on either side or underneath it. Like, mm -hmm. I keep looking at it from a different angle. And I know you can do that, too. Mm -hmm. And then I leave, you know, so that I'm literally not there. And I love how you in the last few episodes were talking about it's not all or nothing. So there are ways that you gradually go to the, leave that independence. Mm -hmm. And I think that when they're little, that's when it's, you sit down and you try and do something together. And I think you're so right when it's always lead with those how questions. Mm -hmm. How do you think we should do this next? Yeah. How do you think we're going to get there? We used to play this game with my kids when we were going someplace that we had been a lot, not driving to New York City or something, but you know, going to the grocery store. I would say, okay, you guys, you have to tell me how we're getting there. Tell me where to turn. I was talking to a client a long time ago. They had two girls and they used to travel a lot. And the dad used to play this game where they would give them the airline and give them the gate number and they'd get to the airport and he would say, okay, you two, you're in charge. And the, together they would go look, or maybe he wouldn't even give them the gate number. Maybe he'd give them the flight right. number or something. And they had to find their way through the airport and the parents would follow them. I just thought like all these examples that you can use where you're helping your kids understand the process of problem solving. And I think that's a really important thing to remember is that it's a process. Well, that's what's so great about travel because mm -hmm. travel removes us from our daily grind where we can stay in a more conscious place mm -hmm. of the things that we say. Right. It's really hard when like we have like a shtick when we're all getting ready right. for school in the morning. But if you're getting on a plane or you're navigating in a car, when they're even like the second they know their numbers, have the youngest child lead the family to say, can you find our seats? Right. Exactly. Let them go down the aisle and let them find the row and mm -hmm. then always give them those little jobs. Mm hmm. I definitely navigated the family in the airport at a young age. But mm -hmm. not only that, we didn't have ways. Our kids are very capable now. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of tools that make things easy. Mm -hmm. But it's fun to think of all the different skills you can nurture with them. Yeah. Finding hotel rooms, finding flights, all of those right. things. Let me just put a plug in if your children are young is that there are all these opportunities for you to help your children problem solve if you get rid of the devices. It really bothers me. And I know, I know, I took a one-year-old and a three-year-old to the grocery store. I told the story about how they would eat the candy off the floor and I would pretend that that was a problem when somebody pointed out to me, but I was so happy that they were being busy eating Skittles off the floor in the grocery store. I get that it's hard. But you have to work as a parent to make sure that you're not losing all of those opportunities to problem solve in your day-to-day -day life, like going grocery shopping. And you say, okay, so we've got to get these three things. Who wants to go and get the carrots? Who wants to go and get the milk? Who wants to go and get this? And being able to talk to your kids through these ordinary things, like traveling is a great experience, but even through these ordinary things of how are we going to problem solve? We need to get this and this and this, or we need to get this done, or we need to get to this place on time. Let's think, how are we going to do it? Hmm, hmm, hmm. Think, think, think. One of the really important parts of problem solving is something that we call sequencing. So sequencing is knowing how you solve a problem in the right order. And when people aren't good at sequencing, Life is really chaotic. That's why building is such a great experience, right? There's, you have to build in a certain order. It's going to become a problem. 
So this idea of sequencing, beginning, middle, and end is a really helpful thing to show your kids and to talk to your kids about to improve problem solving. You know what I just thought of when you were describing that is Mr. Mom with Michael Keaton Mm -hmm. and Terry Garr is worth a rewatch from like 82 or whenever that came out. Yeah. Because in that series of problems, the first few days, first few weeks, he's home alone with the kids and has never done this before. He approaches very creatively all of these things with kids and parenting. I mean, there's that great line when he drops them off and they're like, "Uh, you're doing it wrong. Like the nadir of every parent would be like, I don't know the carpool rules this year. (laughs) I still have that every September. Yeah. But that very comical way he's creative in solving these types of things. Mm -hmm. And it reminds moms, if they have a little bit of perfectionism Mm -hmm. and they want things done a really certain way, Mm -hmm. how do you loosen the grip in the house to let everyone just figure it out on their own? Right. So there may be a certain sequence of events, but sometimes you come up with your own way of getting it done. You come up with your own sequence. You let kids figure it out. If you're getting dressed, there are certain things that have to be in a certain sequence. You have to put your underwear on before your pants, unless you're my son who was three who wore his underwear on the outside of his pants. I remember that. Yeah, but he figured it out. You know, it it took a little while, but uh, it worked. All of these things, like you can talk about training if you get a puppy, like how do you train a puppy or how do we get ready for the school day or how do we cook a meal? And it goes back too to this flexibility in problem solving. There are certain things in which there has to be a distinct order. And then there are other certain things we can problem solve, like Michael Keaton did, where he brought his own creativity or his own flexibility to it. But you've got to let your kids go through the process and look for opportunities for them to find their way to do it. Uh, Robin, here's something that you probably never thought of when it comes to laundry detergent, because I never thought of it. Why does it come in massive plastic jugs that are 90% water? When your laundry machine uses water, Earth Breeze laundry detergent echo sheets, they look like dryer sheets, but they're not. They dissolve 100% in any wash cycle, hot or cold. It couldn't be easier. No measuring, no mess. You just toss them in. Why did anyone think of this before? I don't don't know. know. I don't know. Amazing. Think of how much more environmentally efficient it is not to ship these big jugs of laundry detergent or just lug them home from the grocery store. Those things are heavy. Yeah. And a a lot of them end up in landfills. The packaging is compact. It's biodegradable. It's plastic free. And these Echo Sheets are vegan. They're cruelty free. And they're dermatologically tested and safe for sensitive skin. They offer flexible monthly subscriptions that can be adjusted, paused, or canceled at any time without penalty. I will tell you, I have a smelly family. We need detergent to get the stink out, to get our clothes clean. And I will tell you, I am a big fan. They are fabulous. If you don't like them as much as Lynn does, or I do, (laughs) Earth Breeze will give you a full refund and you don't even have to send it back because they're so confident you'll love them. So now's the time to try Earth Breeze. You can subscribe and save 40%. So go to earthbreeze.com slash flusterclucks to get started. That's earthbreeze.com slash flusterclucks for 40% off Earth Breeze. You're going to love them. All right, Robin, you know that obviously I'm a big believer in therapy. It's what I do for a living. It's what I've done for 30 years. Therapy is amazing. It is amazing. And one of the things we know right now, and I know right now, is that people are having some difficulty finding and accessing therapist. Talkspace has made it easy to find a therapist for you. It's convenient. You meet online. You can meet at home or wherever you're most comfortable. You can talk about anything you want with qualified professionals. It makes it easy and accessible to get the help that you need. Sometimes people wait until something bad happens to talk to a therapist, but why wait? So getting started is really the important part. 
Talkspace makes it easy and affordable. Yeah, one of the things I found is that people put it off because it feels like it's going to be too hard. Maybe they feel uncomfortable. They're not quite sure how it's going to go. At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online. You'll get a personalized match with a provider that's right for you, typically within 48 hours. It's incredibly convenient. You're going to be talking to a licensed therapist and you don't have to commute to appointments. You don't have to take time off from work, set up childcare. It's mental health care made easy, and that's really what we need it to be. Talkspace is secure and private, using the latest end-to-end bank-grade encryption technology to store client information that complies with the latest HIPAA regulations. And it's in-network with most major insurers. As a listener of this podcast... You'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com slash Fluster. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com slash Fluster to get $100 off your first month. That's Talkspace.com slash Fluster. Okay, we're back. I'll give you another really good example that I remember talking about and hearing about is that when we're talking about kids getting homework done. So you may have an idea of how your child should get their homework done, that they should come home from school. And as soon as they get home, they have a little snack. And then it really works if they just sit down and get their homework done. And then they have the rest of the night to do what they want. That sounds good to you. And you feel like it would work out more smoothly for your family. But you've got a kid that comes home and is exhausted at the end of the school day and really needs to be outside for an hour. And it's better for that kid to do their homework after the sun sets rather than do their homework when it's still light outside. And if you live in a place like New England, we cherish those warm, sunny afternoons. I also talked to another family where the the mom was really getting upset because her daughter was setting her alarm for early in the morning and getting up in the morning and doing her homework. And the mom wasn't an early riser. And the mom really thought that the homework should be done at night before she went to bed. It wasn't working for her daughter, but her daughter did a really good job of getting up at, was like 5.30, doing two hours of homework before school and then getting to sleep at 9.30 at night. It took a lot of coaching for that mom to let go of how to get homework done. This daughter came up with a really good idea and it worked really well for her, but mom had a really hard time letting her daughter solve the problem. This is where it sort of overlaps with autonomy in a sense too. Oh yeah. Because it's one thing for a young child to learn how to get dressed by himself or herself, Mm -hmm. but you have to just let them wear the underwear on the outside of the pants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have to just stay quiet and let them figure that out. That's why we as parents, like I always say to parents, if they would only listen to us, their lives would be so much simpler because we know how to do it, right? We already know how to do it. So that's why you jump in because you're like, look, I've done this before. And if you do this and if you do that, we want so badly to step in and just make it easier for them. I mean, we can see what's going to happen, right? You're like, oh boy, I can see what's going to happen. I've worked with so many kids over the last, they're not even young adults, but so many teenagers over the last few months who are applying to jobs for the first time, who are going to college for the first time, who are getting their driver's license or taking driver's ed. I know how to do all those things. I know how to do all those things because I tried and I failed and I hit a car during my first driver's test and I didn't follow up on the job that I wanted. And, you know, I mean, the list goes on and on. It's so hard to just stand back and let them figure it out. And again, it is not all or nothing. You don't ignore, you don't go totally hands off, but you ask those how questions. Another really good question to ask or another really good thing to say is, I wonder, gosh, I wonder how you'll figure that out. I wonder what it will taste like if you put that much salt into the cookies. Mm -hmm. Or I wonder what's going to happen if you put the cookies in the oven and then decide that you're going to go on your Xbox because it's going to be really, mm, I wonder what's going to happen. I wonder how crispy those cookies will be. (laughs) Yeah, I wonder how crispy those cookies will be. So you say, I wonder, and that sparks problem solving in their brain rather than you just giving the instruction. 
So you want to just spark their thinking about it. You know, this is what my husband always said, think one step ahead. That's what he said to my boys all the time. I think I've brought that up before because we wanted them to problem solve. It is really, really hard to let them do it. I know because it's still hard now for me to let them do it. It's still hard. I still want to say, hey, you know, I think you should. Um, mm-hmm. It would work better if you. Mm, yeah, I want to do it all the time. And sometimes I do because it's hard not to. Yeah, because that advice is consistent if they're 40. Oh, yeah. It's just what we want to do. And, you know, the other thing, too, we're talking about kids, but it also to think about this in terms of your partner, right? Your spouse, who are the other adults that you live with? It's so easy that if you have a partner who wants to do something and you're good at it, so easy for you to step in and say, well, you should do it this way or you should do it that way. That whole Michael Keaton reference, I was thinking about it. That's also what our co-parenting episode was about because Mm -hmm. many moms often feel like their partners aren't carrying the same weight, but they often have to ask themselves, are they demanding that their partner follow all of their sequences? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When in fact, if you allow your partner to create their own sequences and get to the result in a different way, you'll find a more engaged co-parent. And the other thing too, is that it just helps you when you let somebody else problem solve or you let somebody else think about how they're going to do something and what sequence or what's important. It also shows you that you might have different priorities than that other person has. You might have a different priority than your child has. One of the things that really just befuddles me over and over and over again is how caught up parents get with their children's hair. It just becomes such a big issue. It just is so interesting to me. That's really the hill you're going to die on. And I'm not talking about a kid dyeing their hair blue or whatever. Even with boys saying like, I can't believe you haven't combed your hair. I promise you, I have never said to my children, I can't believe you haven't combed your hair. It just wasn't even on my radar. When we're stepping in as co-parents and we're not allowing the problem solving to happen or imposing our sequence of things onto our partner or onto our children, it is okay for people to have different priorities. That sounds a little bit more like an autonomy thing than a problem solving thing, even though I know all of these things sort of overlap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think when we talk about it in terms of problem solving, one of the problems that you're solving is what needs your attention now, right? So a huge part of problem solving, and if we talk about sequencing, is really prioritizing. When you help kids recognize what do we need to prioritize now? What's the most important thing that we do first? What do we need to handle now? And what can we let go of? What's really important and essential? And what's not so important and essential? All of that is problem solving too. Being able to say, so whether or not you brush your teeth is much more of an issue than whether or not you comb your hair, right? My personal opinion, because sure, your hair doesn't get cavities. Say you have a child that's really lousy at brushing their teeth, right? Just as an example. And asking that how question, how are we going to figure out a way for you to brush your teeth? Let's talk about that. Let's problem solve. Just like, how are we going to figure out a way for you to get your homework done? How are we going to figure out a way for you to get up in the morning? Because that is a pretty amazing thing to me when a college kid doesn't know how to get themselves up in the morning for class because the parent hasn't allowed the child to come up with a way to make that happen, hasn't allowed them to problem solve independently. Yeah, we actually did an episode on that called Let Your Kids Fail, But Don't Let Your Kids Drown. Right. And being tolerant of the mistakes that they will make and the prolonged effort it will take for them to get something done. Like let them, if it means that they sleep in and get tardies, let them sleep in and get tardies so that they know they need to set their alarm. Yeah. And I think it's sort of problem solving. I think that it's almost like we have to come up with a different term. When I think problem solving, we're going to step in, we're going to solve the problem. It's problem step by step coming to a good solution. Isn't it accountability? Yeah, a lot of it has to do with accountability. That really means that you are 
creating a child that sort of picks their head up and looks around and sees what they need to take care of for a variety of reasons. When I talk about tracking and talking about Life360 and all that kind of stuff, one of the reasons I didn't do that with my kids is because I didn't want to absolve them of the responsibility of communicating with me. Having Life360 on your kid's phone, you might see that as a really good problem-solving strategy because then there's no problems. Everybody's where they need to be. You pick them up at the right time, but it doesn't allow them to develop that accountability or figure out how do I communicate with people if we're late, if there's traffic, if my friend's mom says she can pick me up at the bus stop. How do we make sure that when we're solving a problem, we're not jumping in and short-circuiting or cutting off that pathway to get there? Because it's a multi-step process. And oftentimes when parents are trying to problem solve, they're trying to get rid of all those uncomfortable or messy or inefficient steps along the way. So if you have little kids, Mm -hmm. the takeaway is very much to fold in, I wonder and Mm -hmm. how and walk your children through situations with questions, but don't step in and do something. Mm -hmm. Right. But let's say your kids are older and you might not have given them the room to develop these skills about certain things. And you're like, you know what? It's time because this actually just happened As we were recording these episodes, (laughs) I noted that there was one thing that I kind of have owned because my daughter wants me to just do it. And I then it's been normalized that I do something. Mm -hmm. And then as we were recording this weekend, I was like, you know what? Because she's a teenager now. And I just said, I'm sorry, I'm not doing it. Like I'm not. And you're going to have to live with that consequence. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden now... She approached me the next day and said, I need to learn how to do this. Mm -hmm. And what's frustrating as a parent is that I've actually attempted to teach her in the past. This is how you do it. She wasn't really listening. She didn't really she didn't really care. Yeah. Yeah. Now she cares because she didn't have it done for her. Mm -hmm. And now she's asking different questions. I had to wake up and realize I was stepping in too much. Yeah. For whatever reason, now she has some skin in the game. Yeah. One of the things, and I've, I've referenced this book before, and it's a really helpful book for parents that are dealing with teenagers, the Mike Rira book, and several people have talked about this, is that you're going from management to consultant when you're helping your teenagers problem solve. Mm-hmm. And so it doesn't mean that you don't offer them advice or you don't give them your ideas. We also have to accept that as a teenager, they could very much reject those ideas. I was just going through this with a a client of mine who, as I said, is applying for his first job, and he didn't know what the steps were. He had never done it before. Sometimes I'm in the position where I will offer him the same advice that his parents do. He rejected his parents' advice 87 times, but then I say it, and he's like, oh, that's a great idea. So sometimes it depends on, on who's saying it. And you can say it out loud. You can say to your teenager. So if you're listening to this and you're thinking, oh, gosh, I really have not let my kid problem solved and they're already in 10th grade. Oh, no, oh, no. Just say it. Just say, you know what? I really have realized that I step in and I problem solve for you really quickly. And I think I may have given you the message that you can't do things or I've given you the message that I'm better at doing things. So let's make a shift with that. Let's think about some of the things that are going to be important for you to learn by the time you are a fledgling. It's that assignment that I give to families all the time, right? I want you to take a little inventory of your household and find three things that you're doing for your kids that they can do for themselves and either back off and let them do it their own way or help them figure out the sequence of getting it done. But it's problem solving, problem solving, problem solving. And remember, problem solving, the first word in that is problem. Oftentimes there is a problem and you have to be able to step back and not get so emotionally invested in it, not overreact and not get catastrophic. If there's a problem, how do you solve the problem? It's not just how do we make things go smoothly. It's also how do we figure this out when something does happen? That's really, really important too, right? Because we can talk about problem solving of how do you bake cookies, but we can also talk problem solving of What do you do when you are failing a class or what do you do when you have 
missed a shift at work? Or what do you do if you were supposed to do this and you didn't do it and now there's a consequence? So remember that there's often a problem that needs to be solved. And you as a parent, this is even harder because now there's an issue. You have to just let it be there. And that's really hard. When your kid forgets something, when they don't bring their cleats to the baseball game, when the math assignment is sitting on the kitchen table, when they didn't bring their lunch to school, now there's a problem to be solved. It's sort of like traveling. You have two roles as a travel advisor, Robin. One is that you put together these amazing vacations for people from scratch and you say, this is the sequence of things. You're going to do this and this and this and this. And then the other role you have is that when something happens, how do you step in and help them solve the problem? Because the flight's been canceled, the food is terrible, whatever. Right. Well, the, di- <laughs> the difference is with my clients, I can't step back and say, how do you think you should solve this problem? <laughs> right, right, right. That's the same in my job, too, because I often say parents will come to me and I'll say, what is it that you need from me? And they'll say, just tell me what to do. Right. And in that situation, I'm not going to say, well, what do you think you should do? Right. Because that's just annoying. But I do want to talk to them about how are we going to get to this problem solving place? So, Robin, let's talk grocery shopping. Oh, okay. (laughs) Well, the way we respond to the idea of going grocery shopping is why Thrive Market is such a great option for all of your grocery and household essentials. I love having all the pantry items just shipped to my house. Yep. As a Thrive Market member, you can save money on every single order. On average, people save over 30% each time they use it. I love ordering my cleaning products. Seventh Generation, for example, is a great brand. I just don't like to bring chemicals into my house, and it's great to know that I'm getting the products I want and I'm getting them at a great price. I love Love the filters on their website, which has over 70 filters. So whatever you're looking for, certified gluten-free, uh, non-toxic cleaning supplies for Lynn, whatever you're looking for, you can curate your own shopping experience with the click of a button. And I'm guessing that because you have some dietary restrictions in your house, that that is so convenient to be able to get exactly what you need. It is. So join Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order, plus a free $60 gift. Go to thrivemarket.com slash flusterclucks for 30% off your first order, plus a free $60 gift. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash flusterclucks. Hey, Robin, how many trips do you take a month? I would say on average, I take two to three trips a month. Okay. I'm on the road a lot. Yeah. I'll tell you how psyched I was that my favorite luggage company decided to be a sponsor of this Fluster Clucks episode. By coincidence, it was like the universe made me so happy. So Base Luggage and Bags reached out to us because they have a new line of diaper bags and they are just as fabulous as the luggage that I carry. It's sort of like the Mary Poppins endless carpet bag of where is your stuff and how do you find it? Having a great bag to take with you when you travel, it just, it eliminates one huge stress. Well, that's what's so great is that they took all of the clever design that they put in their luggage and their bags, and then they've made this new diaper bag with equal intelligence. It's got a non-diaper bag look, which I love. Even my husband has actually carried it. And it's also for parents got all these extra added features that make you feel like a rock star in those moments. You can change your baby on an included changing pad, even has a teething ring. And I love this. It has a little pacifier holder that you can attach to the outside of the bag, but keep it in a safe place. I'm just observing the way that families are trying to travel through airports and anything that can make it easier for them and more efficient and that also looks good, I think is something that we can get behind. That's why diaper bags and the luggage at BASE are worthy of every parent's journey. BASE is offering our listeners 15% off your first purchase by visiting beistravel.com slash fluster. So go to basetravel.com slash fluster. That's B-E-I-S travel.com slash Fluster, and you're going to get 15% off your first purchase. Okay, so now back to the show. We want to let kids feel messy stuff. 
they're going to feel messy stuff. It's not like we're going to put them in situations, but it's sort of like what we were talking about last time where you're letting a child try out for a team and maybe they don't know whether or not they're going to make the team and maybe they haven't prepared enough to make the team. And so you're watching, you're like, ah, this isn't going to end well. So you give them the autonomy to be in charge of how they're going to prepare for the tryout. And then maybe afterwards, when they don't make the team, that's when you start the problem solving. If they didn't listen to you before and you say, how are you going to do this in a different way next time? All those questions of expectations and reactions and planning and thinking, it's all about problem solving. We've talked about this before, but you and I, I'm sure we've never, we've never flown together. I don't think. I know. Isn't that weird? Yeah, that is weird. We've never flown together. You're on a plane. Mm -hmm. And let's say you're flying with your children and the captain says, I'm very sorry, but we have been rerouted. We're circling and we're going to have a delay in the air for about 45 minutes or Mm -hmm. whatever. Or this happens on the jetway. We're going to have to go back to the gate because and and, and we're going to be delayed. There's always a fraction of people on the airplane who like bang their seat and get so upset. Yeah. So if your kids are sitting next to you, what do you want to model for them? Right. Right. And so it's great that when disruption happens, how are you modeling your response Mm -hmm. to your kids? Right. Oh, well, that's a kicker. Okay. What do you think we should do now? Mm -hmm. Right. Because problem solving usually starts with a problem and that's okay. It's that flexibility. It's that adaptability. It's the ability to step back from a situation, to not immediately emotionally react, giving your kids the confidence that they are going to have to many, many times in life, figure out what to do when things don't go the way as planned. I'm sure all of you listening can think about all of these situations. You know, I got pickpocketed when I was in graduate school in Boston. I lost my wallet. I had to figure out how to get everything replaced. You get a flat tire. You get lost. You wanted to sign up for this class and it was full and you needed it to graduate. I mean, there's just so, so many situations that come up over and over and over and over again. That is a muscle you want to let your kids work. I can tell the difference. I can tell the difference between Kids who have been allowed to problem solve, who've been given that space, who've been given that room, kids that don't know how to do that, just don't have the confidence, just haven't been given the space. It's not that they can't do it. They just haven't been able to work that muscle. So, so important. What's the telltale sign? The telltale sign is they usually have a pretty strong emotional reaction. It's sort of like what you were saying with your mom, you know, what would you do? How would you do this? One of the telltale signs when I have a family in my office is when I start asking those how questions, the parents have a really hard time being quiet. They jump in, they correct. When the child starts getting distressed because they don't know how to solve a problem or they're not sure what to do, the parents get distressed, they jump in. So the telltale sign oftentimes has a lot to do with emotional management, If I see a kid that's had experience doing it, I can see them sort of taking a breath, kind of pausing, thinking about it. You know, they might sort of say like, all right, all right, let me think about this. Let me think about this. If I've got a kid that doesn't have that experience, they give up very quickly. They give up very quickly. You have kids that you've met in your practice who may or may not be good problem solvers. Mm -hmm. And if they aren't good problem solvers because a parent sort of stepped in. We know that that is stepping in to control an outcome from the parent's anxiety. Mm -hmm. But this is all not a binary ranking. Mm -hmm. Like as you're listening to these three episodes on these three skills, I was describing my own mom being good at one, not so good at another. Mm -hmm. What kind of advice are you trying to give parents as they sort of assess their own strengths and weaknesses What's the goal and what's the range that we mostly fall into? The range that we mostly fall into is that we are going to step in and try and help when we see our kids struggling and when they're in distress. And that's okay. You know, this is not about hands off parenting. It's not about, you know, somebody was describing their parents as benign neglect. It's really about combining the development of these skills 
with an environment of love and support and openness and connection. So I think sometimes people think, all right, I'm too hands off. And this is where couples get into arguments about this. You know, parents, one person thinks that they're too coddling and the other one thinks that they're too ignoring too much or letting too much. It's that big sweet spot that I talk about of developing these skills in an environment in love and connection. And so your child doesn't feel like they're totally on their own. They feel like they're on their own enough so that they can work these muscles, but that if they need you and they come to you and they ask you for help, that you are going to provide it. It's sort of like those leashes that you see with people with dogs, right? It allows the dog to go far away and then we can pull them back in when we need to. But it's a give and a take. Like you say, it's not this binary thing. It's not right or wrong. It's not that you're overprotective or you're going to let your kid do everything. You're constantly making adjustments. It's about small adjustments all the time. And it's really about being open about it. And it's about giving yourself permission as a parent to make mistakes, to talk to your kids about it. It's your flexibility to be able to say, you know what? I think that I was too controlling about that. Or, you know what, I told you how to do this thing and I should have recognized that you were doing it better on your own than you were with me. Consistently allowing yourself to reassess and to talk to your kids about it, right? Like, oh, you were right about that. So this summer, we did one of these shorter episodes on this parenting sweet spot. And what Mm -hmm. I've taken away from you, because I feel like this is what the podcast has taught me and our listeners is that if you create a culture in your family where you normalize talking about emotions or Mm -hmm. talking about mistakes Mm -hmm. and just like these casual ways, Mm -hmm. this is why it's called the sweet spot because we do make mistakes. Yep. And if we can just own them and say, I've made this mistake about doing this and I don't think I want to do this again or I mm-hmm. want to do better at this. And so I'm telling you, I'm trying to do better at this and we will move on together. Mm-hmm. You know, we might score well on flexibility, but not so well on autonomy or whatever it is. Yep. I think one of the most important things that keeps relationships healthy and keeps them connected is when we own our own stuff. And I wanted to say own our own shit, but my mom gets mad when I swear. So I'm just going to say own our own stuff. Sorry, mom. Being able to own it, being able to say like, oh, I get so controlling about that. Oh, while you're applying to college, I get so nervous about what's going to happen to you. I tend to worry about whether or not you're going to be okay because it's so hard for me during this process and I step in too much and I'm sorry. Right. Just say that. Just own it. It's so, so helpful. Right. You can't really do that until you start focusing on your own emotional management, right? Which is the other thing that you talk about. Yeah. It's one thing to talk about your worry about your child going off to school. It's another to not really understand it and then operate from that place Mm -hmm. of worry where you start Mm -hmm. swooping in or controlling or shutting things down. Yeah. This is all woven. It's all together. Yeah. I mean, I've talked about this before. The hardest families that I have to deal with are the ones where particularly the parents don't acknowledge their role in things. It's not about blame. It's about responsibility, but it's also just about being human. And so as you're developing flexibility in your kids, look at your own rigidity or your own flexibility. If you're trying to create autonomy in your kids, look and see. Do you step in and do you interfere or were you raised in an environment in which you weren't allowed to express your opinions? If we're talking about problem solving, look and see what your skills are as a problem solver and how do you want to teach your kids to be good at what you're good at without doing it for them? Own your own stuff. That's the most challenging thing because it's easier to be a manager than it is to be a consultant. It's easier for a lot of people to be in charge, particularly if you're capable, particularly if you know what your strengths are. It's harder to own where your emotional management gets in the way or your rigidity or your obsessiveness, your anger, fill in the blank, justifying, well, the only way my kids listen to me is if I scream at the top of my lungs. You know, that's just the way it is. No, no, you're a screamer. You're a screamer. So that's so, so important. And that's the hardest thing to do. It's the hardest thing to do in a, in a marriage. It's probably the hardest thing to do if you're in any relationship, whether it be professional or whatever. Own your own stuff. Recognize your strengths and your weaknesses and be open about them. 
it's just a wonderful gift to give to your kids. So join the Facebook group so that you can ask Lynn your question on an upcoming episode. Thanks for joining us on another episode of Fluster Clucks. Bye, Robin. Bye, Lynn. If you're a parent, I invite you to join us at the Mindful Mama podcast, where it's all about becoming a less irritable, more joyful parent with sometimes hilarious and always thought provoking experts and friends at Mindful Mama. We know that you cannot give what you do not have. And when you have calm and peace within, then you can give it to your children. I'm Hunter Clark Fields, and I can't wait to see you there. Listen in to the Mindful Mama podcast.